You're listening to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Wednesday, March 27th, 2024, and this is your host, Stephen Novella. Joining me this week are Kara Santamaria. Howdy. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. And Evan Bernstein. Good evening, everyone. Bob is away. I believe he's in Alaska right now. What? Yes, he's visiting his daughter. Oh, cool. Yeah, his daughter basically lives and works in Alaska, and he's visiting her. Wow. Why didn't I know that? I don't know. That's cool. Yeah, she works with wolves and bears and stuff. (laughs) What? Seriously. Yeah, she works at a she works in an a animal circus. conservatory. No. <laughs> Why is yeah. it that we what, that anytime we talk about wolves and bears and stuff, Bob doesn't seem to know more. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why he went to Alaska I to see. brush Daughter? up on his studies. <laughs> Bob, Bob doesn't okay. know. He doesn't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> because there's no nano in it. There's yeah, no, you that's know. Fair. Yeah, that's fair. It's a little terrestrial for Bob. <laughs> yeah. A little too earthy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really neat. She's, you know, she saw lots of pictures and video of her like working directly you know, with these, with these animals. Obviously, that's the so really cool. dangerous ones are behind a fence. It is uh, Alaskan wildlife. It's really that's cool. awesome. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's something, man. You know, she spent her winter up in Alaska. That's dedication. That's it, I understand yeah, that... it gets rather nippy up there. Yeah, can do. <laughs> they it got can. a ton of snow. Like, they got, like, snow off the charts. So last week, guys, Ian mm-hmm. sent us a link to the latest AI phenomenon. Uh-oh. I know I just <laughs> sent you guys an example. This is a uh, Suno dot AI, mm-hmm. S U N O, and mm-hmm. basically it makes songs. So you put in, you could either manually put in lyrics, or you could put in topics and have it make you lyrics, and then you type in a description of the type of music. It could be a genre name, could mm-hmm. be just a description of what you want it to sound like, a style. It doesn't do artists, so you can't say in the style of. John Williams or whatever, you know, it for obvious ah. reasons, it won't do that. But you could describe it, just describe what the music is like. And then you hit create literally 30 seconds and you get a full song, two minutes. Sorry, once again, what are all the parameters you can give it? I just said, so it's lyrics <laughs> and you can lyrics. do instrumental or not instrumental. So, so you actually feed it the exact lyrics or you give it like ideas? Either way, either way. You could, you could, okay. Do, okay. You could do, you could write your own lyrics. Or you could do what I did, which is have ChatGPT make the lyrics, just because I think it does a slightly better job than their lyrics generator. And then I still would tweak it to, for for punctuation. You learn like how it reads what you write. You know what I mean? So it makes correct breaks. So in, if you wanted to say sentences. SGU, you have to do S period, G period, U period. If you put in SGU, it says SCA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. And then, yeah, then instrumental or no, or, or with singing. And then, <laughs> again, mm-hmm. style of music, which could be a genre name or it could be a more of a, just a natural language description. Or you could say use random style and then create. That's it. Did you say Gangnam style? Random. <laughs> <laughs> no, so how many, how many did you go through before you got those two? <laughs> 30, <laughs> 30 or so. <laughs> Were they, I have a question and I'm, uh, this is not, this is, there's no bias here. Mm-hmm. How were they all male singers? No, nope. Okay, you just really—it's uh, just these two songs were the most like, um, like they made the most sense. Yeah. That's why you picked them. Like they were the most coherent. They they were, I thought, a little bit tighter than than yeah, some of the other yeah, ones. Yeah. And you know, and I was just playing around, you know. So they're—I mean—they sound real. Yeah, they sound like real songs. So yeah. if you had like, if this were five years ago, you know, mm-hmm. and somebody played these songs for you. We'll play one in the show and you'll get, you'll hear what we're talking about. We'll play Mm. an actually full song. You wouldn't, I don't think you would question for a moment that this was a real person playing the music and singing the songs, you know? And even now, if you heard it, if you weren't alerted to the fact that these might be AI, I don't think you would necessarily assume that they're AI. You know what I mean? It's right. It's pretty good. Now, when I mean pretty good, I mean technically good. You know, Jay and I were talking about this earlier, trying to find what's the perfect word to describe this. They they are all a bit soulless, right? They're they're oh, a, completely soulless. Yeah, they're <laughs> they're derivative. <laughs> they're not artistic. You know, it's like it oh, is. Oh, the rock opera song literally goes like, "This is a rock opera." Like, well, I think that's that <laughs> the, it, it, see for the lyrics. I told ChatGPT to make lyrics for a rock opera song, and 
and it like incorporated rock opera into the lyrics. I think that's just ChatGPT being stupid. It said that my insights. What 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 was the like, a oh, yeah, like a pearl? Yeah, my insights are like a pearl. Oh, like a pearl of wisdom, right? Yeah. Yeah. My, yes. The... That's why I laughed when I was wondering about the lyrics. Like, if you actually <laughs> told it what to say. No, no. I mean, you can. If you want to write your, that's the thing. If you can write lyrics, you could write your right. entire own lyrics, and then it will set them to music, and you could just yeah. keep reiterating it and see until you get something you like, and oh. playing around with different genres until you. And you could do combinations too. Like, you could, you know what I mean? It's not you could combine different styles of music as well. I definitely like the hip hop song better. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a little bit easier for and also when I made those lyrics I told ChatGPT to make me hip hop rap lyrics uh-huh. about it's the better. SGU. That's all mm-hmm. it was my entire set of instructions. I just said about the skeptic guide to the universe and then it came up with everything. Mm. Minimal effort and and you know far ranging results really yeah. you know in a short amount of time just How long did it take you with all the iterations and things that you had to do to get it where it was? Oh I mean the, right out of the box those like the, those were among the first ones that I made. That's awesome. Yeah. Mm. You know, I tried a couple with its lyrics. But so let me see how ChatGPT does. I tried some with them and then I realized oh I got to tweak them a little bit to you know, for for length and for and for punctuation. Sometimes I would run a couple of iterations and then combine the best verses from a couple of different ones from ChatGPT. And then I just was playing around with a bunch of different styles, barbershop, but just to see what would come up, you know. Like I said, heavy metal, transcendental fantasy rock, just to see what would happen. You know what I mean? It's you know, it's it's pretty much what it sounds like. It's you know, I get it's just another domino falls, you know. I just think this is Ooh. and it's exactly want- like every other in my opinion, every other large language model, narrow AI, you know, technically impressive, but creatively, create, creatively, creatively, I love creatively, it. <laughs> creatively, <laughs> right creatively soulless, yeah, right you know, down. it's, yeah, it's, it's all, <laughs> I was combining two words there. Um, <laughs> What's it's that onomatopoeia? Yeah. Will you, <laughs> Steve, will you, will you make me a stomp and holler song? <laughs> yeah, or, I could do it right or, now. I, I love or that a hit, genre. No, no, Stomp and Holler is like one of my favorite genres. And with what Stop. with what lyrics? The, with with like the SGU lyrics. All right, so I'm going to say, I'll just put the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. It's going to be hard because it will be extra soulless because you really kind of need soul for yeah. those, but it'll be interesting to hear. Were there, I, I have to ask like, you know, like the Scoo thing, like whenever I listen to um, a PDF reader, like a bad PDF reader, like a native PDF reader, and it says like, eeg. Instead of EEG, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, were there any <laughs> other examples other than SCOO of just like bad reads? Well, when I did, when I put in fix? pseudoscience as one word, it said mm-hmm. pseudoscience. <laughs> and so I had to put a hyphen and then it said yeah. pseudoscience. Just okay. weird things like that. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. It, that will get better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. they, they, those are tweaks that they can make. So you can play with this now. You know, it's you get 10 free songs a day. Oh, cool. I paid, I paid 10 bucks so I could play with 500 of them. But, you know, if you just want 10, <laughs> you know. But if you're on a budget. <laughs> well, I figured we would be doing this segment. So, like, all right, I need, I need yeah. more space. I need a little <laughs> space here to play around. You know, oh, to God. me, the bottom line is that, like, most of the AI that people are using today, you know, like a lot of AI stuff has come out over the last couple of years. This is just going to get dramatically better in a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And I was telling Steve this, like, I could see, uh, you know, a reality where people like they have AI make make the song, then they just kind of copy it, record it themselves, and say it's theirs, right? Because if you have it make you a song, and then you don't use that recording, no one would ever know that it was written by AI. Yeah, of course you could just do the same thing with ChatGPT to write the lyrics, or, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, this this you know creates the uh, the song, but again. It's so derivative. Do you really, if you're like that, if you're the kind of person who could play your own music, you probably don't need this, you know, to do that for you. But this is for right. people but, who have zero talent, you know. Right. I, I can't play a note. Yeah. So. All right. So I, it's done. That was in real time. Um, oh. Oh, wow. No way. Two, and it gives me two versions. It gives you two two versions. Oh, interesting. so cool. Kara. Yes. You should feed it a few sentences from your dissertation. 
<laughs> and see what it would come back with. See if they can make something <laughs> emotional. Actually, my dissertation is pretty emotional, but I could find like the the wonkiest part, like the data analysis part or something <laughs> like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. See what it can do. Yeah. Oh, that would be fun. It would. But it would also be interesting to feed it the portions that are like the discussion section where there is actually quite a lot of kind of meaningful personal stuff. Interesting. And make art out of it. Yeah. Yeah, that, right. Oh. Like for personal use, this is great. Yeah, it would be really sure. interesting. Yeah, instead of giving someone a birthday card like they get from everyone every year, yeah. you made a song for them, which they would, you know, be blown over by, most mm-hmm. likely. Mm-hmm. But again, it's like the, the ethics of this kind of stuff starts to get really funky, right? Because what are they pulling from to make this music? Right. Music. Copyrighted music. Right. That people artists worked really hard to make but i think it is like so it's so generic like to the genre like and not a specific person no of course but it's still amalgamating all of the art yeah in order to how is it how is that different than a person who's listened to all that art than making a song in a genre they have to have a frame of reference it's not but that person would be getting paid to do that that's if, you know, That's if you the were doing it for your personal use, and again, like you, you, you can't use this, and like, you can't produce an album for this and sell it, right? That's, you can't, but you can probably. Let's say you're like a podcaster who's starting out, and you want to put like music at the top of your show. Why? What's wrong with that? You probably could do that, right? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. historically, you might have hired a musician to <clears throat> produce that music for you. Yeah, right? but you know what? Y- yes, maybe. But you know what? We did fifteen or whatever nineteen years ago. Mm-hmm. We went to PodSafe Music. And downloaded mm-hmm. a free MP3 file and right. used that. And, there and was I like, had my boyfriend at the time write something for yeah, me. There was like thousands of free songs to choose yeah. from. So I don't think it's, it's much different. Right. There have always been sort of like workarounds yeah. and options that way. Uh, I sent you guys those two songs. Oh, you did? I'm listening okay. to one of them They're right now. They're pretty good, actually. Let's see. I'm listening to them, too. Okay. In a world full of questions and doubt, we seek the truth, we hear the call. From the depths of curiosity, we rise above, we'll never fall. With open minds and a thirst for knowledge, we seek the facts, we'll never sway. Through skepticism and critical thinking, we'll find a way, brighten up the day. Where the skeptics reach in for the stars. First one's a, terrible. It has sounds, a. Uh, it sounds like country music. It has a gospel feel. Yeah, the to first it one's almost. awful. Hate it. <laughs> Hate it. Nope. Hearing don't it. like either of them. Second one's a little twangy. Hate them. <laughs> well, I mean, it, Hate is them. that is that this genre? Eh, is it it's, correct? It's, it's a version of it. No, it's not the version of it that I like. I like. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. Well, who's an artist? Uh, that... Lord Huron is one that I listen to a lot. Okay. So it's much more sad, the ver- like the, the style of Stomp and Holler that I really like. And this feels very country. The, so these were lyrics made by the music app. They're not as specific as the ChatGPT lyrics that I made. Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah, these okay. are more generally about skepticism, whereas the ChatGPT had a lot of details about the SGU specifically. Right, naming us. Naming us, yeah. Right. Et so would you call this a rabbit hole, Steve? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> oh, yeah, this was supposed to be our opening banter. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ooh. I guess we can move on to some news items. What do you think? Sure. Makes sense. While, while we're still writing these ourselves. <laughs> yeah, good point. So the, this is the latest iteration of preliminary study being completely gullibly um, reported by the mainstream media to scare everybody into not eating or drinking something which is perfectly healthy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So if you, a few weeks what? ago, <laughs> I love it. A few weeks ago, we talked about oats. 
I kind of, I, kind of, I had this patient who, oh, who asked me about it, and I'm like, oh, don't worry about that. That's nothing. That's like, and like, oh, thank goodness. What am I going to do without my <laughs> oats? I eat them like every day as a health food, and now suddenly it's going to kill me. And it's like, yeah, that's the whole problem with this. You take these preliminary studies. And then you fear monger based upon them without any context. Most of them don't turn out to be anything actionable. Uh, so it's really frustrating. Okay, but this this time the target is sweetened drinks, right? Like soft drinks, okay. which is, is which is a popular target for this kind of of research. But th- and this includes sweetened with sugar or with artificial sweeteners. Right, either one, which is okay. which is attacking both. I pretty got odd when you think about it. But what they found was that there is an increased risk of atrial fibrillation among people who report drinking two liters a week or more of sweetened soft drinks or sweetened drinks. This was a a, a prospective cohort study, which means it's observational. Right, uh, it is part of the UK Biobank, and it was over ten years and involved two hundred thousand participants. So. Like many of these observational studies, especially ones that use like a national da- database, you can get a lot of numbers, right? So it could be very robust. But the downside is it's observational, so it's uncontrolled, <laughs> which means there's no con- you can't control for confounding factors, which further means you can't make cause and effect conclusions based solely on this data. So they found a 20% increased risk if you drink drinks that are artificially sweetened, 10% if they were sweetened with sugar and an 8% lower risk among people who drink fruit juice on a regular basis. So that's pretty much it. What, but what can we say about this? So the, the authors you know, correctly and almost mechanically point out this is an observational study. You can't make you know, specific conclusions based upon this. But they, then they go on to say, uh, this is in a in a uh, this is a quote in the press release. However, based on these findings, we rec- we recommend that people reduce or even avoid artificially sweetened and sugar sweetened beverages whenever possible. Do not take it for granted that drinking low sugar and low calorie artificially sweetened beverages is healthy. It may pose potential health risks. So that's where I really strongly disagree with the framing of this study because you cannot make that recommendation as a public health recommendation based upon this data. Absolutely, you cannot. And telling people like not to drink low calorie beverages can have potential downsides, right? Right. Especially people who are relying upon them to reduce their sugar intake. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's clear evidence that there's an advantage to not drinking hundreds of calories of sugar every day, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So let's talk about the caveats. And most of these hopefully will be reflexive by now for regular listeners of the show, right? It's, there are, what are what are the potential confounding factors here? So first of all, this is self-report, and people notoriously self-report inaccurately, especially when you're going back years, like you know, and so that makes means the data itself is is unreliable. Uh, but even if we take the data itself at face value, uh, because it this is a uncontrolled observational data, we don't know what all the all the confounding factors are. So. And they and they were able to show that there were lots of confounding factors that they did not control for. The only thing they really tried to control for was genetic predisposition to AFib. You know, people who drank more sweetened drinks tended to be more overweight, tended to have other cardiac risk factors, and this is like almost a universal risk factor, were of lower socioeconomic status. Uh-huh. And so they didn't I, control for any of that? N- oh. They did not, no. Did they control for like lifestyle factors like smoking? Well, they, they did independently look at that, and, they, and, they, and what they found was that if you smoked, the negative effect was worse, but it was still okay. there even when you removed that factor. And what about like how much you exercise? Yeah, so they didn't control for any of that. Interesting. Right, because they didn't have all, all those things are going to be correlated. So, yeah, so, all of oh, them. Yeah, so... There's so many different ways you can draw the arrow of causation Mm -hmm. here that other than drinking sweetened drinks causes atrial fibrillation, right? You know, our diets are complicated, you know, first of all, right? And being, and even saying something about people's diets is complicated. And they correlate with so many other things in terms Mm -hmm. of our, that, that impact our health. So here's, you know, so for me, like I'm reading this and I'm waiting for like this one particular piece of information 
And it didn't drop until the very end. To me, it was like I was shocked that they didn't even look at this. But um, at the end of the press release, uh, and it's buried in the study, they say, it is also unknown if sugar and artificially sweetened drinks contained caffeine. So they didn't even assess oh, for no the amount of caffeine in the drinks. Hmm. Now, when I was writing about this for science-based medicine, I did some re background research on, okay, well, what's the association between caffeine and AFib? Right. And it's really complicated, actually. And it doesn't necessarily increase the risk of AFib, but we, I don't think we really know the answer at this time. Interesting. Even at really high doses? So unfortunately, well, probably yes at high doses. Mm -hmm. Like the So, all right. So part of the problem is most of the caffeine and AFib research looked specifically at coffee intake. Mm -hmm. And that's very complicated because coffee contains about a thousand compounds and some of them are known to be cardioprotective. And in uh -huh. fact, if you drink like one or two cups of coffee per day, it seems to be protective against AFib. Uh, but that's there's probably nothing cardioprotective in soda. <laughs> yeah, so but that's it's hard to know if yeah. that's really the case. Like the not everybody buys that data, right? Because right. it's again, it's complicated. And and there have been meta analyses that basically say, yeah, it's basically a wash, you know. And, and in terms of, but that's looking at coffee. And then they say, and then they say, yes, we actually need to do to actually study this in a controlled manner because we don't manner. We don't really have a, have the high quality data that we would need. I could not find any data looking at caffeine from soft drinks specifically. Mm -hmm. I could find data from caffeine from energy drinks, and they do have a higher risk of AFib. So the question is, would soft drinks be more like energy drinks or more like coffee? My bet is on energy drinks, but not as bad because they don't contain as much caffeine and sugar, but you know, but they still right. contain, but they, but they look more like that than, than coffee, which is a more, much more complicated, you know, combination of factors there. So that wasn't an easy, you know, an easy answer in terms of the background research, but this study would have been a great opportunity to look at the association of caffeine from soft drinks and AFib, but they didn't even look at it. Um, so at the end of the day, I think that this study is essentially uninterpretable in terms of what it means for public health. We can't say it, the data is too uncontrolled. They didn't control for so many obvious variables. They didn't even look at caffeine. And here's the other thing, and this is true of any study where you're just looking at what people eat. There's always a flip side to that question, right? Mm -hmm. Because in many ways, what we consume is a bit of a zero-sum game, right? You can only drink or eat so much. And if you drink a lot of something, you are not eating or drinking a lot of something else. Right. So, and I like, for example, like people who eat a lot of meat probably don't get enough vegetables, right? And so is it the, really mm -hmm. the meat that's the risk factor or is it the, well, I'm not eating any vegetables, that's the risk factor. So here, is it that you're drinking a lot of sweetened drinks or that you're not getting your fruit and veg for the day, right? Because the people who weren't drinking a lot of sweetened drinks we either were drinking water or they were drinking fruit juice or they were drinking something else, you know, and that something else could be something that in and of itself has a protective effect or is healthy or has more electrolytes or minerals or whatever. And so it's also like you just can't lump together yeah. people who are drinking. I mean, you already said this, but like people who are drinking high sugar sodas with people who are drinking diet sodas. Right. That's the other thing I found just They're generically. They're wildly different things. Yeah, it's weird about this study. Why would they be the same? They would have to mechanistically be entirely different. <laughs> yeah. Right? The fact that they're both sweet is a very superficial commonality there. They're right. different chemicals. They, they get different calories. They, they have a completely... The biochemistry is so different in your body. It's completely different. Yeah. So that, to me you know, made the, made the results a bit odd as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, at the end of the, so I think at the end of the day, this is a preliminary study. It is the kind of study that we could use to generate hypotheses, but not draw firm conclusions. You can't make any recommendations based upon this. It was irresponsible to make health, public health recommendations based upon this kind of data. And I do think that in general, we need to raise the threshold of when we trumpet these kind of results to the public with warnings or scary headlines or whatever, 
This is, you know, there, it creates so much of this noise that it confuses the public and it reduces their their confidence in the system, right? Sure. Oh, completely. And, yeah. and how many times, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, ah, one week you're not supposed to drink this and then the next week it's fine. I know. You know they, they just get so <sighs> overwhelmed Jaded. with the yeah. noise. Yeah, right. yeah, with and the, then yeah. they stop trusting their doctors. Exactly. Yes. Then when you and, say, oh, vaccines are good for you, then they don't know what to, what to believe, you know? Right. It sort of contributes to that as well. So yeah, this, it's all that, it's all those little snippets of misinformation that yeah. people hear over and over and over again until like one day they wake up and they don't realize that it's become a fact in their head. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, that, yeah, and they're making life decisions based on it. Exactly. Which is, yeah, which is not to skip ahead, going to be deeply relevant to the to the topic that I'm going to talk right. about in a minute. Oh boy! Like the, the, another the, thing. Yeah. That's so, sorry, Steve, but another thing that's super frustrating about this is because when you look at these observational studies that are just taking a cross section of a huge group of people, it gives you no information about, for example, most people when you look at their behavioral decisions. While it may be true that some people their whole lives have have drank diet soda because it was a choice that they made. They were like, uh, I don't want to drink high sugar drinks. Diet soda seems like it might be a healthier choice. I'm going to start off drinking Diet Coke. A lot of people, I'm going to use people from my own family, for example, found out that they were pre-diabetic or diabetic and switched to diet soda. Mm -hmm. And because they switched to diet soda, they are now making healthier decisions, but they are you know, in some ways trying to undo a lifetime Mm -hmm. of sugar intake. Mm -hmm. And so you're sort of looking just at a cross section of time, but you don't know how much of that like biochemistry is from before (laughs) versus now. Exactly. Also, again, because with observational data, Mm -hmm. you don't know, like you could say there's a correlation between drinking, you know, diet drinks and diabetes, but is that because... They're drinking the drinks because they have diabetes. And exactly, that they it? just switched over yeah. because of the diagnosis. That's like there's a huge correlation between dieting and being overweight. Yeah. Right. Is it's that... like we're switching. So... Yeah, exactly. It's like the so, arrow goes in the other direction. Yeah, there's a, there's yeah. like a healthy user effect and there's also mm-hmm. like an unhealthy user effect, right? Yeah. So, and either of those can happen depending on... The, you know, the context. That's why observational data is so tricky. And you don't care how many times, like in your profession and my profession, where some correlation has been in the literature for years, maybe decades, and then somebody comes along and flips it on its head because they thought of one confounding factor nobody mm-hmm. else had controlled for before. Completely, you know? because sometimes yeah. it's obvious, right? Because there's face validity and you can make a mockery of the whole thing. But sometimes, you know, you can't. It's it's like saying that there's a core, you know, it's like saying there's a correlation between depression and antidepressants. Yeah. It's like, well, clearly, because we're treating depression with antidepressants. Yeah. But if it's, you know, if we didn't know that already, then it wouldn't be so obvious. Yeah, one of, one of my favorite examples when I read about it, I was like, oh, yeah, this really is a good example to use to demonstrate this is the association between alcohol and longevity. And it turns out that the uh, people who drink a little bit of alcohol tend to be healthier than people who drink no alcohol. And this led to the, well, alcohol in small amounts is actually protective. It makes you look longer. But it turns out that that the no alcohol group included a lot of ex-alcoholics who had already (laughs) destroyed their health. (laughs) <laughs> and, right. and once yeah. you remove that as a confounding factor, the beneficial effect of alcohol goes away. Uh-huh. But that that was like a decade in the making before that got sorted out. I mean, it's like, oh yeah, what about all the sober people? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Wow. But of course, everyone's just going to remember. Oh yeah, that's all. The sweetened drinks are not good for you. Yeah, right. but don't worry. The media will sort it out for us, yeah. right? <laughs> All right, Jay, tell us how big a difference one degree can make. Let me turn that around on you, Steve. Do you think or do any of you guys think that you could detect a one degree temperature change? Yes, I believe I can. Fahrenheit. Kara? Celsius. Doesn't matter. Oh, that's a wider range. <laughs> exactly. One it degree. It depends. Are you talking you think, about like easier. In, you think in if water, you were in a room with in your house? Food. Oh, in my room, in my house. One if I degree. turned up the temperature by one degree, do you mm, think you can feel not. it? Honestly, probably not. Yeah, like I, I don't. I believe I can. Well, you're a mutant. There's, there's <laughs> largely, you know, it's something that is pretty undetectable, right? Yeah. It, it, it. Temperature fluctuations happen literally when you walk from room to room in your house, and you're not like, yeah. you know, dramatically like, oh my god, you know, one degree isn't really that much, but 
it's profound when it comes to our climate. And it's a really concerning situation because let me jump right into this. Like a recent study by an ecologist named Andrew Richardson. He uh, He's at the Northern Arizona University, and he published something in the Journal of Geophysical Research, and he went into detail about the severe consequences of slight temperature increases on snowpack in boreal forests, you know, northern forests, right? So this is a really serious problem, and the research that they did was fantastic. It really, really cut down to the bone here on what's happening. So the forests that span the northern regions of, of three continents, these play a, a pivotal role in our planet's ecosystem. You know, basically, most forests around the world, you know, have a, a very large impact on local ecosystems, if not, you know, all of them. I would imagine that they all do because of how many animals and different types of plants that live live in those areas. So their research indicated that even a minimal war- warming, like one degree Fahrenheit, can lead to a substantial decrease in snowpack. So why should we care about snowpack? Well, snowpack does a lot oh, of different things. It's actually reflects that sun away. Yeah, like it's it's very effective from keeping heat out of uh, you know going down into the ground. It's like a it's like an insulator of the cold. And when this happens, when when that cycle is broken, when the snowpack lessens or or you know if it disappears, this creates a cycle of warming. So the less snowpack we have, more sunlight and heat are absorbed by the ground. And then that leads to an increase in soil temperature. And then that leads to the air temperatures increasing. And then this speeds up this process of snow melt, right? So even a little breach inside that snowpack cycle that we have can have a a profound downriver um, impact on, on, you know, the way that these, these forests operate. So the process is happening faster than scientists originally predicted, which is another thing to worry about because, you know, most of global warming is happening faster than than many of these uh, climatologists, pre- you know, predicted. You know, going back twenty years ago, and we're not ready for it. That's the problem. You know, we if we had more accurate estimates back then, we probably would have, hopefully, would have been further down the road of trying to, you know, counteract some of it. So there was something called the Spruce Experiment, and this was done in northern Minnesota by the U.S. Department of Energy, and that that study that they did was the basis for the study that I'm actually reporting on right now. But let me, let me tell you about a little bit about the spruce experiment, because I thought this was really interesting what they did. So first off, it was a very, it was an extensive experiment. They used a 30 foot by 20 foot enclosure or multiple 30 foot by 20 foot enclosures. And they equipped these with fans and heaters to mimic future climate conditions. And they did this specifically to observe the effects of temperature changes on, on, particular ecosystems. So they took a time-lapse uh, photography. Every 30 minutes, they take a picture. And what they were able to do was to just see what changes take place. And this helped them monitor the, the conditions inside each of these different enclosures. And they were able to estimate that snow depth and snow cover um, allow, it allowed the researchers to draw comparisons with historical snow depth and precipitation data. And they clearly saw with minimal temperature change just how much the snowpack uh, could be affected by, you know, just by a minor temperature change. Like you would think one degree, you know, what would that do? It actually does a lot. One degree is actually profound when it comes to snowpack. So any degree of warming resulted in this dramatic reduction of snow cover, which, again, you know, it, it affects the plant life, the soil ecosystems, all of the animals that live there, whether they're insects or, you know, larger mammals or whatever they are, even uh, very small temperature changes started this decreasing and steady uh, amount of snow. So the temperature changes that they observed didn't just stress out the ecosystems, but it also increased the mortality rates of the animals that were living there, including the plants. And these new observations are critical in refining current climate models. So, you know, they give us a window into you know what's happening and what the the potential future is in the soon you know this is going to happen soon guys you know like we're we're living in it right now you know so what's happening this study is really cool because it zooms in on like you know very specific region we're talking about snowpack here we're not talking about the ocean we're not talking about weather patterns just what what the changes in snowpack does in these forests that that exist in a very small part of the world 
Yeah, unfortunately, the, the last few years of climate research has been finding that, you know, our predictions about maybe it's how much warming we're going to get isn't, isn't as bad as we thought, but the effects of the warming we are going to get is going to be worse earlier. Yeah. Right? And so... Yeah. Not, yeah, and we're kind not of... exactly a consolation. We're kind of seeing that now, right? Like, this is worse than they thought it was going to be at the current level of, of warming in terms of negative effects. It, we're at that point, Steve. It's so obvious. You know, this isn't like... We're not back in the 80s. Yeah. Where we really weren't seeing it. There wasn't a lot of, you know, there was proof, but it wasn't like as tangible it is today. Like it is happening. It's happening everywhere. It's affecting, you know, every ecosystem in in our world, right? I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. having an effect on weather. It's having an effect on forests. It's having an effect on people even having access to drinking water or having way too much water. You know, the flooding that's been going on. You know, this is just the absolute very, 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 very beginning of Things that are going to take place that, that might largely be unpredictable, but we know that they're going to be severe and we know that things are going to change very quickly. Yeah, I think the most unpredictable part of it is the tipping point. It's like when exactly are they going to happen? The amount of warming has been pretty much in, in between like the two standard deviations that the models have been predicting. It's been actually very accurate. I know a lot of the, the what I would call the climate change deniers argue that the climate models have not been accurate, but that's just not true. It's just factually correct that the models have been very accurate. They are predicting the amount of warming that we have seen like over the last 20 years. So we should have a pretty high level of confidence in them, but we don't know what the tipping points are going to be. And by tipping points, we mean like when are the ice sheets going to collapse into the ocean, you know, and things like that. We don't know exactly when those things are going to happen, although we have a range of when that's going to happen. And it's a little bit harder to predict like what the feedback loops and the, the negative climate consequences are going to be. And that's, unfortunately, you know, we're discovering that our, our, it's worse than we thought it was going to be. It's going to be get worse earlier. These studies are rolling in. You yeah. know, like I'm seeing them all the time now. You know, like as the funds were allocated for, for these, um, you know, different organizations to do deeper research into into these issues. Like we're seeing the information. It's there. It's clear. You yeah. know, we're seeing it manifest globally. And mm -hmm. I I don't understand for the life of me, guys, I don't get it. What the hell is the lack of effort? What, why well, aren't we... Listen, I don't, don't think we should... We talked un about that. Yeah, we, don't, we shouldn't underestimate the task ahead of us. We have a global technological civilization that is built around fossil fuel. And that is, we shouldn't expect that to change easily. But it is unfortunate that there is, you know, there are some political, you know, ends of the spectrum are pushing back against doing anything about it. And that, um, you know, even I think people who want to do the right thing often don't know what the best path is. But the bottom line is, we have to invest a ton of money into this in order to accelerate the you know transition to a low carbon economy it's just it's happening we have the technology we really just need the political will to invest the resources to make it happen as fast as possible and that is hard to do it is unfortunately hard to do so my it seems to me that what's been happening and what i think is probably going to happen is that it's going to happen at its own pace just based on the technology itself Maybe we could make a tiny little difference on the margins, but I don't think that anything political is going to make a huge difference just because we don't have the political will, unfortunately. Yep. A lot of damage in the meantime. And it'll be a lot. Yeah. We just, that's the only variable is how much damage will be done in the meantime. That's, and you know, our kids will know or our grandkids will know. Mm -hmm. All right, Kara, tell us about birth control misinformation. Oh, there's so much. So the Washington Post has done kind of a series of articles over the past several months. So props to a couple of reporters on there, Lauren Weber and Sabrina Molly, who have been writing about this topic, misconceptions around birth control. Basically, there is a big movement on social media and especially TikTok, also to some extent Instagram, where we see a lot of kind of re repurposing of TikToks 
where there are these social media content creators who are making quite a bit of money telling young women to get off the pill and, you know, ditch your IUD, ditch your birth control, and here's why and here's how. And it would be one thing if the reasons behind this new push were legitimate, and it would be one thing if the outcomes of these pushes were safe. The problem is this is mostly misinformation to a pretty potentially devastating consequence because I'm not sure if you remember what's been happening in the world lately, but uh, abortion is now banned or restricted in about half the states in, mm -hmm. in the United States. So if young women are choosing to ditch their birth control and are choosing instead to utilize, quote, natural alternatives to birth control that have high rates of failure. What many doctors are anecdotally, I have to say that, anecdotally um, telling reporters that they're seeing is um, a lot of young women coming in with unwanted pregnancies. Um, we don't have the numbers yet about upticks because this is a pretty new phenomenon. But many of the doctors that are being interviewed for some of this coverage are saying that their patients are telling them that social media influencers are fueling their choices to get off of birth control and that their reasoning is um, very often due to things that the doctors are then having to counter because they are not uh, evidence-based. Should we call them TikTok babies? Is it too early to do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably going to oh, have boy. to start happening, sadly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is motivating this misinformation? Where do you think the kind of the bulk of the, the commentation, the commentation? That's not the a word. wellness. Just wellness. Write influence. that down, too. Right. And when we think of wellness influencers, what do we think of usually is the political alignment of that? We usually think of that as like a, a kind of a like Libby left wingy kind of a thing, right? No, it's, mm. I think it's both. Sadly, this is this is coming out as a very conservative mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole new wilderness out there. We're seeing more and more conservative commentators and influencers. There are a few names that are specifically being cited here. There's someone named, let me find her first name. Her last name is Bendayan. She's actually a Spanish influencer. She's 29 years old. Nicole Bendayan, who has a million followers across Instagram and TikTok. She's a holistic health coach. Mm. She is not a licensed medical specialist at all. She calls herself a cycle syncing nutritionist. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Wow. That's. Mm -hmm. She herself stopped using hormonal birth control because she was concerned about weight gain, low libido, and intermittent bleeding which she claims were side effects of her birth control after going to several doctors who she th she says dismissed her symptoms. She stopped using birth control. She says her symptoms went away. She told her followers that her that birth control and again none of this is clearly n medical advice nor backed up by any legitimate research she told her followers that birth control depletes magnesium vitamin b vitamin c vitamin e zinc levels she charges money for virtual programs that include analyses of blood panels see why this is, is it that practicing medicine without a license why isn't she in jail I do not know because she's in Spain possibly she because she puts a disclaimer she makes it clear. Not she enough. says, quote, I always make it clear in a disclaimer that I'm not a medical professional and I would happily work with their health care team. Yeah, but if you're educator. taking money Wait. to give health advice, that's not mm -hmm. enough. So mm -hmm. is reading a blood panel like what? Taking some blood, putting it on one of those glass things, putting it under a microscope? I think just and... get, no, getting, I think she's probably a just... Lab, you know, getting a lab to do... Yeah, getting the readout. 
the lab has already analyzed. Oh, the I see. Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah. they come back with the numbers and the figures. And then and she, she will, gives she them will interpret a that. regimen. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And recommend um, a course. Mm-hmm. She's mm-hmm. actually had, I think, some of her videos removed. Yeah. TikTok recently removed five videos linking uh, birth control to mental health issues after the Washington Post reached out to TikTok specifically and saying, hey, TikTok, how are you preventing the spread of misinformation? They're not. Mm-hmm. And they're so not. They, they're waiting for the Washington Post to exactly. contact them, and then they'll be So reactive. TikTok took down the video saying that they violated company policies, quote, uh, prohibiting inaccurate, misleading, or false content that may cause significant harm to individuals or society. And then, of course, Ben Dian's statement was that she, quote, fully supports the removal of any content that may inadvertently perpetuate misinformation. And then said, quote, as I often remind my audience, it's essential for individuals c- to conduct their own research oh, and yeah. see comprehensive understanding, especially considering the limitations of short form content. I mean, this is so dangerous. And what we're seeing um, also, we've got Brett Cooper, who is a commentator for The Daily Wire, which is a conservative um, publication, who is claiming this has been debunked time and time again, that birth control impacts fertility. We know that this isn't true. This has been debunked over and over. We've got Candace Owens uh, denouncing birth uh, control, uh, uh, both pills and IUDs as unnatural and impacting fertility. And, And of course, Ben Shapiro talking about birth control side effects, claiming that birth control pills, that women on birth control pills are attracted to men who are less traditionally masculine. Okay, so here is something that here here's a really really interesting one. So there's a woman named Brittany Martinez who founded a magazine called Evie, and her magazine has been questioning birth control quite a lot. And she actually has started another company. She co-founded an app, like a, a tech company called Twenty Eight, that is backed by Peter Thiel. I don't know if you guys remember Peter Thiel, but mm-hmm. he was one of yeah, PayPal's original founders. Yep. So so 28 is a menstrual cycle tracking app and it's really kind of pushing to stop using hormonal birth control and start kind of using the rhythm method basically to to prevent pregnancy. And there are interviews in this WAPO article with a sociologist from the University of Colorado, Amanda Stevenson. And it's pretty interesting, the sort of connection between these sort of conservative pushes, these anti-abortion activists and legislative pushes to restrict birth control and these appeals on social media to sort of demonize and push misinformation around birth control as medicine and push for these sort of like rhythm methods and things that we know can be effective but have massive failure rates because it's very, very difficult to, to utilize them effectively. It's, you know, they fail if somebody is peri or premenopausal. They fail if somebody, if it's, you know, their basal body temperature is off. They fail if somebody has recently had an abortion. They fail if somebody's hormones are not easily measured. And so... So they're recommending one solution for all of it, basically? Yeah, right? they're, basically one, one... Me- they're, they're basically recommending no h- hormones and also no medical insertions like IUDs. And they're saying that all of those medical options cause side effects. And now what we do need to be clear about is that some of these side effects are real. There is a very, very, very low risk of blood clots in uh, hormonal birth control. And it's the estrogen, not the progesterone, that causes these blood clots. There will be a new birth control that's over the counter that's going to be on the market soon. But Mm -hmm. it's progesterone only, so that risk of blood clots won't be involved in the -the over-the-counter pill. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most of the the hormonal blood – sorry, the hormonal birth controls that are available now are combined estrogen, progesterone, and they do have a risk of blood clots is very low. I think it's something like, th- okay, three to nine women out of 10,000 women who are on the pill. So that's still lower than the risk of developing a blood clot, clot during pregnancy, right? Right. So if you got pregnant, you have a higher risk of getting a blood clot. 
mm-hmm. than if you're on the pill. Mm. Right. So it's like risk yeah. management. We have to think about these things. Risk versus benefit. Uh, right. Exactly. Yeah. Probably all things um, considered, you're at lower risk than, an, than the risk of an unwanted pregnancy and everything that goes along with that. Totally. And there are other side effects. Like we, you know, there are side effects of, you know, some, some women have nausea, some women have breast tenderness, but usually those side effects can be mitigated by switching forms of birth control. For me, for example, this is purely anecdotal. I had, as as listeners know who have been following the show, I had a hysterectomy um, in 2021. Was that 2021? 2022. Yes, 2022. I no longer need birth control. I cannot get pregnant. I do not have a uterus. Um, but I still take the ring because it re- – like when I went off of it, I had just like acne explode. And so for me, the side effects of not being on birth control are higher. So I remain. I, wor- I, I worked with my gynecologist, and we decided I'm going to stay on birth control because I would prefer the positive side effects of birth control. And for a lot of young women, that's also the case. I got on birth control long before I was sexually active because it made my periods lighter and less um, intense, and I was I felt less ill when I was on birth control than off. And so there are a lot of different reasons that women take hormonal birth control. When you look at some of this misinformation that it can affect your fertility, that it um, yeah non non doctors basically scaring people totally with, with that no it's right affecting to do so. yeah your your different vitamin loads these things that they're just making up or they're pulling they're cherry picking from poorly controlled studies or from debunked studies you know just just from from bad research yeah. um, and that's really really dangerous because very often not only are these um, individuals who are not licensed medical professionals they're individuals who don't have any scientific training right so they yeah. don't know how to read they're, these they're, studies. They're, they're, they're about as unqualified as you can get. But what ends up happening, which is very dangerous that we don't often think about, is that the algorithms in these social media platforms work to the advantage of the videos. You watch one video that says birth control is dangerous, and then you go, well, that's interesting. That worries me. And then it links to another one. And then it links to another one. And before you know it, that's all you're being fed. So of course course now you have this bias and you work so then when you go to your doctor you're like i want to get off my birth control and they go why and it's like well because clearly it's bad for me and they go why do you say that well because every video on tiktok is telling me that (laughs) even if every video on tiktok doesn't say that every video you see on tiktok says that Mm, tiktok clinic great Mm -hmm. just what just what we need it's really dangerous. And it's not just a TikTok problem. It's an Instagram problem. It's a YouTube problem. And for some people, that is the news. That is the internet. That a is lot. reality. Right. The younger generation of people. Terrible. That's who's on birth control. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Right. It's like, no, they're, they're right. it's people they're who are menstruating. Who are, yeah. Right. They're the people who are are going to be impacted by this mm-hmm. and you know and we also i think we have to remember as well that just like we were talking about before because i think sometimes it's really easy to sort of blame the victim it, we in the healthcare profession we kind of as a whole in in sort of the institution also share a lot of the blame like individuals have good reason to be distrustful especially women especially people of color who don't always have good relationships with the healthcare system who haven't always been listened to believed treated well and so like now now is the time that we need to be bridging these gaps that we need to be building trust you know when when people are coming in we don't need to be talking down to these women making them feel stupid you know rolling our eyes when they come in and they say but tiktok told me this is the time to be listening to be spending time with them to be educating in a real kind of respectful way Mm -hmm. Um, because we don't want to make this rift grow you know, that we could be doing real, real kind of lasting damage to vulnerable young women by not listening and by furthering their distrust. Yeah. Well, as a clinician, you are supposed to give information to your patients in a non-judgmental manner. 
right? Of course. Should never come off as being negative or judgmental towards your patient because this yeah, is why. There's a big difference between theory and practice. Yeah. I know. We've all seen I know it. that. I yeah. know that. But that is the standard. Yeah. And I, I, yep. you are correct in that, you know, we do need to be reminded of that frequently. And mm -hmm. it all, you know, physicians today have to be aware of what's going on out there on social media. They, they have do. to be aware of it. It's part of the profession yeah. now. You can't just ignore it. Absolutely. All right, Evan, tell us about iridology. Yeah, iridology. <laughs> Something uh -oh. that doesn't come up all that much. And, and you know, there are a lot of pseudoscience topics that we have covered over the year, but some of them come up more frequently than others. And some remain either, I don't know, untouched, lightly discussed by us. And I think it has to do with the fact that some notions, some of those pseudosciences, they're so steeped in antiquity. Yeah, it's just that, extra stupid. Right. <laughs> and, and they and they've kind of even, you know, lost their luster over time, but somehow they still kind of can pop up even in the year 2024. One of those pseudosciences is iridology. That's the belief that looking at the features of a person's iris can yield information on what might be ailing that person. And this is a type of homunculus theory of medicine, which we've talked about before. Homunculus means little man. In other words, there's a little entire you to be, in, to be observed within a certain part of your body, or in some cases, a bodily fluid, which I've read about as well. Now, reflexology, the homunculus that exists on the sole of a person's foot. Palmistry suggests a homunculus within the palm of a person's hand. And iridology, the homunculus in a person's iris. And yeah, the subject doesn't pop up a lot these days. It's an anti-scientific way of thinking about diagnosing the health of a person, a total throwback to a time when, what, other health theories like chiropractic and animal magnetism were, were getting started, all 19th century kind of stuff that was, that was coming along really before we got a better grasp on scientific approach to medicine. Who is it? Ingatz von Presley, Prexley, Hungarian physician. He was the one who came up with this. You know the story, Steve. Oh, yeah. The yeah. owl. Yeah, yeah an 11-year-old boy, he noticed an This was in 1861. There's an 11-year-old boy. He noticed an owl in a tree in his backyard. He tried to catch the owl, and the owl had a broken leg, or he broke on its legs accidentally. And there was, and he looked into its eye. There was a dark stripe that had developed in the lower part of the owl's iris. But then he healed, he tended to the owl, to the injury, nursed it back to health. The owl became kind of, I don't know, like a like a a pet in a sense, but he later noticed that the appearance of white and crooked lines in the part of the iris where the dark stripe had been, had taken over. And there you have it, an entire pseudoscience born in the mind of an 11 year old child in the middle of the 19th century. So it's in the news. And here was the headline I read, using alternative medicine to unlock genetic clues through the eye. Yep. The article is a puff piece. And if you think about it, that's a very clever pun. It's a puff piece <laughs> from an Orlando, Florida news outlet, you know, um, you know, when they puff the, uh, the eyeball with, mm. uh, with treatments, right? Mm. Orlando, Florida news outlet featuring holistic iridologist Jessica Halpern. Now, she had learned about iridology about 20 years ago uh, when she went to see actual doctors about a condition which she was experiencing, and she was clearly unsatisfied with the result. So a friend suggested, hey, go see this iridologist instead. And she was so impressed by that iridologist, she became an iridologist. And to become an iridologist, you don't have to have any formal medical training, which, you know, would frankly only get in the way with things like <laughs> double-blinded yeah. clinical trials, you know, that annoying kind of stuff. But Jessica says iridology can help see if someone has an increased likelihood to develop a particular disease based on their genetic makeup. Here's a quote. I can see predispositions. I can tell someone I see a genetic predisposition. Everything going on in the body registers through the brain, and the brain sends the signal to the eye. So through the iris of the eye, which is the colored part, we can see the health of the body's systems. Steve and Kara, did you know this? Oh, yeah. Mm. I mean, right. They taught you this in medical school. Kara, I'm sure you learned about this during your study of neurology. I mean, yeah, and there's a whole bunch of well-designed <laughs> research to support it, right? <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. So, of course, uh, the vast majority of doctors in general reject these claims. 
But Halpern has, has an answer to that when she was confronted in the interview. She said, well, a lot of them, a lot of doctors, don't want to interfere with what they're doing. Don't forget, they make a lot of money prescribing medications. That's she, so lazy. I mean, that is yeah, the lazy conspiracy <laughs> yeah. nonsense. Like, it, you know, you, you don't spend two seconds even thinking about that. You know what I mean? That's like such a hand waving defense. My gosh, it, it, it is so base. And, and the excuse, it, and so everybody uses that excuse. It's who attacks insulting. Yeah. The doctor's like, oh, big money. Yeah, you're only in it for the medication <laughs> and the, and the making money off. Right. Uh, they also interviewed a patient. His name's Roland uh, Pankowicz. He's gone to iridologists for years, and he uses this as an assessment tool to gauge his overall health. He says it has helped him manage his family's mental health history, Kara. Mm. He says, I have some mental health issues going on in my family, so I feel iridology can help predetermine if I may have to deal with something like that down the road. For me, it's been scary accurate to the point where I've had pain on one side of my body and it's been obvious in my eye without me telling the practitioner that there was something going on. Yeah. So it's a form mm. of fortune telling. Yeah, is, probably. Basically what He's like, it's so obvious because I'm limping. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but I didn't have to tell them. It's a cold reading. Like a, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, the iridology diagnosis basically is doing a cold reading. But, you know, people going to see an iridologist for mental health reasons that that struck me as kind of new. I don't I don't usually come yeah, across I've that never, when I'm reading stories about that's this. That's true, actually. It's never come so, across my desk. Iridology does have, uh, obviously, there have been studies done. The ones that have have the tightest controls obviously show no 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 effect whatsoever. It absolutely does not predict anything. And there's tons of horrible studies out there in which, obviously the proponents of iridology cling on to as a possible thread of legitimacy as to what they are doing. And then also be careful because in the modern age now with iridology, uh, it's about utilizing modern technology in the practice. And I read, uh, this was published in, this was December of 2023. So only a few months ago, the Journal of Engineering Proceedings, they posted a study titled A Methodological Review of Iridology-Based Computer-Aided Organ Status Assessment Techniques. Hmm. So what they're basically talking about here is that uh, – I'll read it from the abstract. To find patterns that are connected to particular medical conditions, computerized iris analysis software may need to examine thousands of iris images. A method of iridology known as computer-aided iridology, or CAI, uses software – to study the iris. Oh my gosh. So they're getting, you know, they're obviously taking advantage of modern ideas, modern software programs, technology. Who knows if they'll try to incorporate AI at some point into all of this hmm. to try to help further substantiate what they're trying to do. However, this paper obviously came to the conclusion that iridology is a pseudoscience. It makes unsubstantiated claims that can identify medical disorders by examining the iris. And it does not provide any reliable means of diagnosis. There is no scientific proof to back up its claims, even with this technology. <laughs> yeah, it's like using sensitive EM detectors to detect ghosts. It's still pseudoscience. Right. I don't care how much gadgetry you have. But again, it makes it seem superficially more plausible to mm -hmm. to people with, as we like to say, more money than sense. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't think, you know, and something like phrenology, that's not something that is widely I, I don't think accepted by people these days, and even if there are a few fringe people out there who might, it, it, it yeah, doesn't. The few it doesn't have it. People is a good good way to say it. But uh, hey, look, you know, with TikTok and something, I wouldn't be surprised if there is some some phrenologist out there who has half a million people listening to what he has to say on on a social media platform. So TikTok you know, is a cesspool of misinformation. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Absolutely. it seems like it's getting worse. Yeah. It's getting mm -hmm. worse. All right, Jay, it's Who's That Noisy time. All right, guys, last week I played this noisy. Well, I got a lot of guesses. Uh, this was a an odd one for sure. This one, this uh, answer was sent in by a listener named Colin von Huring. And he said, hello, Jay. I think I recognize this week's noisy and it would be really nice if I could win something today. 
saying he was, he was saying he's having a bad day. Okay, well, let's see what happens here. That sounds to me like the marble digital clock that a maniac on YouTube built. <laughs> so I looked it up and I found marble it. Marble digital clock. And I agree. I agree with Colin. The guy's a maniac. He he made this machine that made a hell of a racket. It was like lifting up all of these different black and white marbles and kind of sorting them. And then it would it would shoot them down these like alleyways and it would spell out the time. Oh, like neat. with different colored marbles. Very complicated. I don't know where people find the time or the money to do stuff like this, but it, yeah. But that's not it. But it was a very cool guess. So I have a listener named uh, Rich who wrote in and said, Hi, Jay, that sounds like the Phalanx Weapon System, better known as CIWS, or yeah. he says CWIS, in the Navy. And CRAM, CRAM, in the Army. I, I mispronounced it right there. How about that? It is not those weapon, weapon systems, but I totally understand why you picked that be- because there is a sound of things kind of launching in there, which I agree. So I think that was also a good guess. Michael Blaney wrote in and said, Hi, Jay, it's coming in waves, which makes me think it's actual waves, as in the beach. So I'm guessing it's waves flowing into some kind of electricity generator. I thought this one was interesting as well, because I totally did not hear like a, a water type effect here. And then when I re-listened to it, I kind of I kind of can see where that's coming from. Uh, someone named Scuba Steve wrote in and said, Hey, guys, and Kara, this is Steven. Uh, his last name is Borsi, like horsey. Thank everyone gives me like phonetics to help. I love that. Names. <laughs> uh, he's from Petal, Mississippi, and he's going to guess the noisy is a plasma cutter with a conveyor belt running material under it. That is not correct. And Simon Michael Moore said, Hi, Jay, this week's noisy sounds like a vent or some sort of high pressure system. Like an air compressor, it makes a loud hiss and vents excess air. That is also not correct. There was no winner this week, and I'm not surprised. I picked this noisy because I just thought it was a very interesting sound. But what you're actually hearing here, have you guys ever seen one of those vinyl or plastic carports that some people have out in their driveways, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like a kind of like a tent that has, um, you know, like a, like a semicircular top to it, like a curve to it um, that a car can fit into. And what what this noisy is, is somebody put a heater in one of those and there was snow on top of it and the snow is melting and then all of it is kind of sliding off this vinyl, right? So it's snow sliding on vinyl. Oh, boy. That makes that noise. Just Hmm. thought it was a cool sound. And sometimes I'll just include a noisy that I think, you know, you should hear because it's just an interesting sound. I have a new noisy this week. And this one was sent in by a listener named Austin Vosier. All right, so if you think you know this week's noisy or you heard something cool, email me at WTN at the skepticsguide.org. So, Steve, if you happen to go to the skepticsguide.org homepage, there are lots of buttons on there, all of them um, leading to shows that are coming up. Now, as you hear this, this show is going to come out on today. We're recording this on the 27th. It's going to come out on the 30th. Most of you are going to be hearing this early next week, uh, you know, the 1st, 2nd of April. It's not too late to buy tickets. We have tickets left for the extravaganza that's happening in Dallas on the the weekend, uh, you know, Friday the 5th. Then we have the 6th is the extravaganza, and then we have the 7th, which is the two private shows. So there is a noon private show that also has seats available that you can get tickets for. And then we have two shows happening in Chicago in August, and we are going to be doing an extravaganza, and then we will be doing our 1,000th SGU episode. Oh, my gosh. That is the recording of the 1,000th episode. It'll actually come out the following Saturday. Mm -hmm. But that is indeed the 1,000th SGU episode. The only person that recorded every single one of those episodes was Steve, of course. Steve has Mm -hmm. never missed an episode. I probably missed – I don't know. I don't even know. We have to figure it out. But Yeah. We all have missed a handful. Yeah. I've missed probably one a year on average – but um, it's all going to happen. So if you're interested in seeing the SGU live, you know, please go to our website and check it out. We have the Dallas and then we have Chicago. Just so you guys know, we will all be appearing at SciCon in October. 
That's going to be in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And we we are even talking about maybe doing yet another live performance, maybe in November, December, January. We Early December, yeah, I think. We're oh, looking. Boy. We're TBD, looking. right? To be yeah, announced. Yeah, it's coming up. We've got lots of talking to do, but we're we're still... Our dance card's pretty full, guys. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, we're getting around. So do me a favor, guys. If you're enjoying this show, there's a couple of things that you can do. One is really easy. Just give us a review anywhere. You know, you can go on iTunes, whatever. It just helps people find us. Uh, just, you know, be honest and tell, let other people know what you think about the show. And another thing you could do, if you really want to help us, you could become a patron. You can go to patreon.com forward slash skeptics guide. Um, we have a wonderful group of patrons. We have an awesome Discord channel. The the patrons have gotten to know each other, and that's why we started Nauticon, to give them all a place to go and congregate. Lots of friendships are being made. It's really awesome, and I'm very proud of it. And very, you know, I feel very lucky that we have such a wonderful group of people. If you'd like to join this wonderful group of people, just go to patreon.com forward slash skeptics guide and help support this podcast. Thank you, Jay. Um, all right, we have a couple of emails. The first one's actually a TikTok video that was mm. tagged to us. Have you guys ever heard of Mel's Mystery Hole? What? Uh, uh, do I want to have heard of that? No, you <laughs> didn't think so. <laughs> what do you think it is? Uh, uh, what? One of these bottomless pits? Yes. Kind of? One of these oh, bottomless uh, pits. All right. Right. One of the many bottomless pits that are not bottomless. Yeah, yes. it's supposed to be near <laughs> Ellensburg, Washington. First popularized by the radio show, Evan. Oh, it would be Coast to Coast, Coast Art Bell. Coast to Coast in 1997. There you go. The guest calling himself Mel Waters, you know, talked about the hole. That's how it became known as Mel's Hole. And it's supposed to be, supposed to be a, this bottomless sinkhole, you know? Or at least it's extremely, extremely deep. The, the caller claimed that it was at least 80,000 feet deep, which ain't possible. You know, just um, stuff could would not hold itself open to that depth. You know, dirt, would rocks would just collapse in on itself. Uh, but that was the claim. And this spawned a lot of local modern legends, right? Just Just urban legends in the area. Here's the thing. There are sinkholes around the world. That's not that unusual. Right. And and it is common for there to be, you know, urban legends surrounding it. But I don't know that this one even exists because <laughs> in 2002, a group of 30 investigators led by one Gerald Osborne went on an expedition to investigate the hole and they couldn't even find it. <laughs> They couldn't <laughs> find the thing, so I don't know that it, it exists. So the TikTok video in question, which we will link to, is just – it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous because it's <laughs> saying like what scientists found at the bottom of this hole will shock the world. You know, <laughs> <laughs> It's like the most <laughs> shameless sensationalism you can imagine. Oh and then gosh. meanwhile – it's showing in you know it's this is the voiceover it's showing pictures of these of like 20 different sinkholes right it's like pick yeah. one mm-hmm. <laughs> you know cuz it cuz it doesn't exist they don't have a picture right. of actual mel so they just show <laughs> different sinkholes why you, of course you wouldn't do that if you had a picture of mel's hole right you wouldn't need to do that but yeah it's just uh Complete nonsense. All right. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, that's a fun one. The next, we have an email that comes from Kai, and Kai writes, My husband was recently diagnosed with stage three cancer, and he's now in week two of six of chemo and radiation therapy. Nearly everyone we talk to tells us it's so important to keep a positive attitude. But mm. the skeptic in me wonders, what's the mode of efficacy? Exactly how is that positive attitude helping? And has it been scientifically tested? To me, it seems akin to the so-called power of prayer. You can't pray cancer away, so why should I believe that a positive attitude will make a difference? In recent years, I knew a woman who was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. No one had a more positive outlook than this woman, and she took on the challenge with a strong, I can do this attitude. She died six months later. So my question again is, what's the mode of efficacy? Exactly how is it that a positive attitude helps and has it been scientifically tested? 
Well, thank you so much for writing in. I am so sorry to hear about your husband. Of course, we wish him the best. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like you're doing the right thing, standard medical care, you know, which I would heartily endorse. And listen, there's nothing wrong with keeping positive, trying to find the silver lining, you know, and not give up, et cetera. But there's no wrong way to have cancer. Like whatever your emotional reaction is to having cancer, that's fine. That's, there's, you know, like no one could tell you that it's right or wrong. And Karen, you and I have talked about this, I think, several times on the show. Mm -hmm. the, the whole problem with the positive attitude thing is that it basically puts the blame on the patient. And if things don't go well, it's like, well, you clearly didn't have the right attitude. Because yeah. if your attitude can cure you, a bad attitude can kill you. Yeah. And that's not fair. And it's not true. Has it been researched? Yes. You mm -hmm. know what the effect of a positive attitude is on cancer survival? Nothing. Nothing. It Absolutely has no nothing. effect on survival, right? Does it has it, effect on some things, but not on survival. Yeah, on whatever, your your mood, your experience of the thing, or whatever. Your, but does it affect your survival? No. Cancer no. is cancer, and your attitude does not affect the cancer. No, it doesn't. And you're 100% right. What it can affect is your quality of life during mm -hmm. your experience of cancer treatment, because it puts inordinate pressure on somebody who's already trying to juggle so much. Right. So often in, you know, I work, I work with people with cancer. Mm -hmm. I do therapy with people with cancer. And so often one of the number one things that I work with people on is the burden that they feel trying to kind of calibrate their mood for other people. Right. Sure. And not you know? upset their family members yeah. to they try to keep them up because they're, yeah, They absolutely. feel so much pressure to stay put on a brave face or yeah. to stay happy sure. or to put on a brave face because they feel like that's what they're supposed to do. And it's exhausting. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's soul crushing. Yeah. Um, and so I try to stay away from the word positive and move towards the word authentic Mm -hmm. You know, I often ask them, you know, what, how are you, how do you want to be right now? What are you feeling? What's like, what's true to you in this moment? And try to work towards that. A, a great book that I would recommend to the listener, if, if she's interested in reading it, would be um, Bright Sighted by Barbara Ehrenreich. How the Relentless Promotion of Positive Thinking Has Undermined America. Sure. <laughs> and it's, it, it talks about lots of different examples, but she does specifically talk about cancer and how difficult it is on mm. cancer patients um, and how it can actually undermine their experience. And some people, you know, one of the first things I do when I sit down with the patients that I work with is I ask them, how do you identify? Like, are you a fighter? Are you a survivor? Are you a... a you know, excuse my French, but a f cancer kind of a person mm. are you? And everybody has a different view of their relationship to cancer. Some people don't want to even think of themselves as cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And it's that's not fine their too. identity. It's not their identity. Yeah. For some people, it's their whole life. And, you know, there's no right way to yeah. be in it. And that's what's really important, I think, more than anything else yeah. is to is to be true to true to your own experience. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my wife had breast cancer and she did very, very well, luckily. Mm -hmm. But she so we went through that together. And she, you know, one of the things that she experienced was like, well, as soon as you get the diagnosis, it's like you're on the other side of this wall from everybody mm -hmm. else. Yeah. Like there's you and then there's everybody else who doesn't have cancer. You know what I mean? It's not mm -hmm. staring this in the face. And it is, it can be isolating and it just alters your perspective of everything, of reality, of your life. And it's just, it's hard to, you can't understand it unless you're there. And you so can't. like if you're somebody who is like the loved one of somebody with cancer, don't assume like you know what they're going through. Don't assume you know what it feels like. And certainly don't put any pressure on them to be a certain way or to have a positive attitude. It's like, if you want to cry, cry. Whatever you want to do. It's like you're going yeah, you through something. you want to something. scream, scream. Yeah. Or you want to not feel anything today. You don't have to feel anything today. That's fine. Today. Yeah. That, but uh, that whole thing of like, you just, you got you to gotta keep hope alive. You got to stay. As if somehow if you stop hoping, your body, like your cells will be like, well, no more hope. Just let the cancer yeah, win. Mean, like it's the weirdest <laughs> mentality. Well, but for people who have a, uh, a predisposition, say, to that attitude, religious or otherwise, mm -hmm. I mean, 
if they, they may not know any other coping strategy. Mm-hmm. And if that works for you, that's great. That the problem is it doesn't – your thoughts don't translate to your like white cells. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think of that's course. the thing that we have to remember and it, because w- really all you're setting yourself up for is a lot of guilt and shame. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the religious version of it's even worse. When you tell people you could pray your cancer away, and then they don't, well, you mm-hmm. didn't pray hard enough. God doesn't yeah, right. love yeah, you. I mean, you the whole didn't pray That's hard awful. enough is just, what else are you going to say, you know? Yeah, what blaming. does that actually mean? Like, that you're not praying long enough? You're not <laughs> right. really you didn't do deep, it right. deep Devotion, and mean yeah. it or whatever. It's just silly. But here's the thing, Carrie. Tell me what you think about this. My sense is, and I know because I've been there a million times, right? It's like when you're the person who doesn't have the terminal illness or, or the horrible diagnosis and you're mm-hmm. facing somebody who does, it's hard to know what to say. The oh, it's 100%. Very, it's very difficult to be in a situation where you can't think of anything genuinely positive to say. Because it's because it's there isn't horrible. anything you Because there say. isn't anything positive. Yeah. So I think most people say that because they're desperate to find something right. not horribly negative to say. So they say, well, be positive. They're just, but it's they're okay just to say something like, yeah. this sucks. Yeah, it's okay. That's to say, an I'm, okay to say. Just say, to, this sucks. I'm here for you. You know, that's totally. And I think one of the things that I've found that is really frustrating for a lot of the patients that I've worked with, one of the, the most annoying things, one of the things that they say is the most annoying to hear <laughs> is when people go, I don't know how you do it. They mm. say that that is by far the most irritating. Wow, yeah. People are like, I don't know how you get up every day. And they go, what is the alternative? Right, right, right I right. do it because like, they're like, that's just what you do. There's no alternative, right? There is no alternative. They're like, because they always go, I don't know. I would just, it's like, it, the alternative is not to roll over and die because let me let, me let you in on a little secret. When you roll over, you don't just die. Yeah, right. You, you still just gotta, lie there. You still got to face the day. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually you got to pee. <laughs> and eventually you get hungry. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you don't, it doesn't, you, you're still alive and you still have to take your meds and drink your water. And that's just how life is. But I think it's probably a good idea to think about what you should say in situations like that so you have something ready to yeah. go. Because mm-hmm. otherwise you're going to panic and say something stupid that makes it worse. Because that's what most people do. Yeah, and I think that's a good idea in life. In life, like in if you're, it's mm. a good idea with your partner, with your friends. It's a good idea yeah. when somebody's going through a breakup or when somebody's depressed. It's a good idea to ask them, "Do you want me to help you solve your problem, or do you just want to sit here, or do you yeah. want me to help validate what you're going through?" Right. Like all of these are great ways to address somebody who's going through some shit. Mm-hmm. You know, it's exactly. not about solving their problem. It's not about giving them platitudes. It's about reminding them that they're awesome and you love them and you are a you person in their life yeah. yeah who's there that's it yeah that's a yeah. good default start there totally but don't think you have to say something positive or you have to fix the problem or whatever because that's usually counterproductive if, if and if, really we all there. that is reflective of is your own anxiety yes, and honestly right. exactly. a little that's bit right. of a yeah. little bit of your narcissism, know, if I'm being 100% to... on it. <laughs> well, it's your yeah. discomfort yeah. with having it is. not knowing it's what to say. It's your discomfort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Sure. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. It's time for Science or Fiction. It's time for Science or Fiction. Each week, I come up with three science news items or facts, two genuine and one fake, and then I challenge my panel of skeptics to tell me which one is the fake. Kara has a lot to prove this week. She's bouncing back <laughs> from a double solo failure. No oh, pressure. No. no pressure. All right. Wow. None whatsoever. Whoa. But I should point out a very rare Certain, True. Uh, this is why it's so it's novel. First Damn it. Time that's ever happened. <laughs> totally. All right. So these are three news items, but there is a theme to the news items. They are all about power, right? These are about energy and making. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's happened to be a lot of, lot of energy news, so I just used, I clustered them. Okay, here we go. Mm. Item number one researchers have developed an implantable battery that is powered by oxygen in the body and capable of producing continuous electricity at 1.3 volts. Item number two Toyota reports its latest hydrogen fuel cell car 
will average 845 miles on a single tank of hydrogen. And iron number three, engineers have created flexible perovskite solar cells with a power conversion efficiency of 25% and maintaining 90% of this efficiency after 10,000 10, bending cycles. Ooh, I heard a little groan from Evan there. <laughs> I think Evan I wants think was, to go first. I think it was first. Kara. <laughs> <laughs> Kara, your voice has dropped this, a few octaves. This <laughs> third one, uh, the flexible uh, per- perviscite solar cells. I mean, can't you express this in like ways? I mean, okay, for example, <laughs> maintaining 90% of this efficiency after 10,000 bending cycles. I mean, can I have that in like calendar or something like years or something i mean what's a, what's a bending cycle well what? that's an, obviously an engineering term they they i'm assuming yes. they st- had some kind of standardized bending of the material okay and, and then they test they did that ten thousand times probably had a machine do it bending the material and then they tested it again and it worked it, it had 90 percent of its original efficiency because uh, it's supposed to be okay. flexible right flexible. so if it's not right if it's if it breaks down then it's not flexible right Gee whiz. Um, okay, bending cycles, fine. All right, power conversion efficiency of 25%, which is what? See, I'm relying on information I have in my head, and I have no idea if it's correct or current. Are we at like 18 20%, 22%? About, so, uh, about for silicon rigid okay. you know, uh, solar cells. Okay. All right. So, so I'm commercial. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you giving me that at least. So, okay. So higher efficiency plus this, uh, you know, maintaining most of its uh, integrity even after ten thousand bending cycles. That's uh, that's impressive. Now these these tend to, I don't know. <laughs> we right, don't we overstate the whole power thing uh, when it comes to efficiency increases and these kinds of things. So that one has markers of it being fiction. I'll say that. I have no idea. I'll go backwards. Then Toyota reporting its latest hydrogen fuel cell car will average 845 miles on a single tank of hydrogen. I read something not too recently, but kind of recently. Was it Toyota? And was it about this specifically? But I don't remember the 845 miles on a single tank of hydrogen, but I knew that they were doing something with the hydrogen fuel cell car. Or was it Honda? I think that one's science. And then the first one, oh, an implantable battery powered by oxygen in the body. Oxygen's delivered through the blood all over the body. So it's blood-based, capable of producing continuous electricity at 1.3 volts. Continuous, well, maybe that's the trick there. Is that this continuous electricity? How, how does it how does it maintain that powered by oxygen in the body, but producing continuous electricity at one three? Yeah, all right. I'll say that that one is the fiction. I and I think the part that's wrong here is that continuous electricity part. Okay, Kara. No. <laughs> oh, you went last last week. <laughs> Where's Bob? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's almost I, as if I designed this for Bob not being here. I know. I yeah, think, right. I do think the hydrogen fuel cell one is science. Eight hundred forty-five miles, though it seems bananas, is reasonable given that we're you know we're pushing three four hundred miles on electric charges right now. Mm-hmm. So you know double that for hydrogen fuel cell. That's okay because hydrogen fuel cell is significantly more efficient. We know that we're just still struggling with transport storage, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think that that you know we've always known that's a, I, I do think a more efficient source. Um, so go Toyota, flexible perovskite. I don't know. Okay, power conversion efficiency of 25% and maintaining 90% of it after 10,000 bending cycles. I feel like this is high. I don't know, though. But this feels high to me, like very high. Maintaining 90% efficiency after 10,000 cycles. Yeah. That feels very high to me. 1.3 volts, though, also feels high. Is that, like, supposed to be millivolts? Milli vanilli volts. <laughs> so this, okay. Okay, so implantable battery, that works for me. Implantable battery, I'm not mad at. 
Powered by oxygen, I'm not mad at, because like you said, it, so long as it's someplace that's bathed in blood, which is like the whole body, it's going to be able to get that fuel, that power that it needs. And continuous electricity. I don't think that voltage is making me too mad. So I kind of mm. think that one is going to be science. I think the solar cells are too high. So I'm sorry, Evan. Ugh. No, that's okay. I, I, I was yeah. close, Kara. Yeah, it's true, because you were still questioning you. that. So yeah. I, think, I think I'm going to say that the, the solar cells are the fiction. Okay, NJ. Well... Well, <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to cut to the chase, <laughs> I, uh, I just don't, I agree with Kara. I don't see how, oh, um, thank God. <laughs> yeah, I'm the Lone Ranger, Ranger this week. <laughs> I don't think anything would maintain 90% after that many cycles. I mean, it just sounds way too good. You know, it's just, it's just too good of a scenario. I wonder if it's I, even I mean, 25% at the beginning. I, I hope it's. I hope it's legit, but I, I think that one is probably it. I mean, the oxygen-powered battery, like, okay. I mean, sure. I mean, I don't think if somebody got there with this, it's probably like in super early you know, stages, not like they're doing it. And then Toyota, um, I see no reason why anybody would have a problem getting 845 miles out of a, of a hydrogen based uh wow car if that one turns out to be the fiction steve really pulled a <laughs> really fast one on us that's yeah sure. i'm 100 percent with care i'm going with that that oh, thank you 100%. all right so you guys <laughs> divide between the first and third one so we'll start with the second one toyota reports its latest hydrogen fuel so car will average 845 miles on a single tank of hydrogen you guys all think that one is science and that one is the fiction <laughs> <laughs> you got us what? You got us good, Steve. <laughs> that is the what? Fiction. We were so convinced that that oh, that's wrong. That one's so right. Sure. Sure. So now, what is true? And, and I didn't know if I was going to get somebody on being familiar with this, but it, Toyota was able a couple of years ago to get um, one of their cars, their hydrogen fuel cell cars, to go 845 miles on a single tank of hydrogen. But it was but. completely fake because they like overinflated the tires. They turned off all the electrical stuff in the car, and they drove very slowly the whole way. <laughs> right. So right. So oh, a so scenario in which that. nobody would ever yeah, so, actually right. use so this that, vehicle. That's about twice what you would actually get with Adam Damn it. Drive, driving. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So the 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 yeah the the hydrogen fuel cell cars are running three fifty like two. So just like electric cars. Yeah, pretty much right in the same range with electric mm. cars. I thought they were more efficient. They're not. They're ah. one third as efficient. Electric Battery electric vehicles Yikes. are three times as efficient as hydrogen. Then why are we mm. even talking about hydrogen fuel cell That's cars? right. That's exactly why are we. <laughs> so here, and they will what? always be lower efficiency because... Uh, you have to first of all, you have to make the hydrogen, and you have to comp hydrogen. You have to compress yeah. the hydrogen, which takes a lot of energy. Yeah, and then you have to store it someplace where it's not going to blow up. <laughs> right, <Is> that <laughs> which limits how much you can carry around. And freezing it, I mean, not not freezing it, but liqui liquefying Liquid. it, is also takes a lot of energy. But it it only gets you so far. Like you know what I mean? Like that's basically the maximum density of hydrogen you're going to get, uh, and that's even like less than gasoline. The most efficient efficient BEVs that we will get to will be more efficient than that. Will be will be more energy dense than that. So I yeah, I just don't think that hydrogen's a good fuel for cars. You know, maybe for trains or maybe even trucks or something, but there's too many advantages to the battery electric vehicles and the batteries are just advancing too quickly. And it's just it's too late. You know, maybe if they were ten years ahead of where they are now, keep in mind Less than 1% of the hydrogen we make in the world is green. Less than 1%. Most of it is made from fossil wow. fuels. And so uh, that's not un work. until we get to the point where we're mass producing green hydrogen, it's all nonsense anyway, right? But anyway. Extracted from the ocean. Yeah, this, this, this one is fiction. But if you had just read the headline, you might have been fooled Ugh. without reading the details. But the word average in there makes it 100% fiction. All right. Um, let's go back to number Damn. one. Researchers have developed an implantable battery that is powered by oxygen in the body and capable of producing continuous electricity at 1.3 volts. That one is science. I did leave out a little detail, though. So the 1.3 volts is correct. 
but it only produces 2.6 microwatts per centimeter squared. So that's too little to even run like a pacemaker. So it just doesn't produce enough current. Oh, you know? So what do they think it could be helpful for? Right now, it's just a proof of concept, right? Oh, okay. So yeah. they would have to... This mm-hmm. was done in rats, and what they did was they, you know, they planted it under the skin. And initially, the energy output was intermittent until the blood vessel, until the wound healed, and then the blood vessels reestablished themselves. And then once that happened, it produced continuous electricity and it does so it basically combines sodium and oxygen uh, to to produce the current and it's so it's a it's a viable proof of concept the question will be is can you get it efficient enough so that something that's you know that biocompatible that you can you know implant in a human would be produce enough electricity to power something useful like a pacemaker right so i don't know if we'll get to that point uh, it would be, you know, be a great option if you could, you know, because you're just running off of an energy source in the body. You don't have to recharge it or replace it or whatever. That would be nice. But yeah, this one isn't going to get us there. This one doesn't have the energy density. All right. And that also means that engineers have created flexible perovskite solar cells with a power conversion efficiency of 25% and maintaining 90% of its efficiency after 10,000 bending cycles is science and this is a nice little breakthrough this is a good incremental advance that 25 percent is about where the best silicon solar cells are right now where the rigid you know crystalline solar cells are the average one that you would get in commercially would be 20 22 percent so it's actually a little bit above that i don't know what the upper limit uh, is the perovskite are supposed to have a higher ceiling than silicon and so the, the, one of the big problems, of course, with perovskite is getting it to be stable. And so this seems like it's uh, – this formulation, is uh, this flexible formulation is, is very, very stable. Um, again, I don't know if we're quite to a commercial product yet, but we're getting very, very close. And, you know, in the next certainly five years or so, we should be seeing not just these incremental improvements in the silicon solar cells, but a nice shift to a new technology – either organic or perovskite or some combination and and with flexible solar cells that can really, uh, you know, accomplish a couple of things. One is just make it easier to install it in a lot of places and two, to bring the cost per kilowatt hour down. It's already uh, very, very cheap, but we want to make it cheaper than fossil fuel, like cheaper than any other, uh, than any other option. Let me ask you guys a question. If we have, if every residential home in the United States had solar panels on the roofs, what percentage of the country's energy demand, electric, I should say electricity demand, not to confuse it with you know, cars or whatever, of electricity demand would be met by that rooftop residential solar? Every uh, single single family home? Yeah, say, if every single one did it, we maximized residential solar. 100%. Oh, no, 100% 50, of the single family. Half yeah. would have of, it. It would be 100% of residential. Of right? residential would be met. Yeah. Of homes, I mean, not apartment buildings, not not uh, business, obviously, I not see. industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. we'd hit almost 100%. No, it'd be, it'd be about 30, 35%. Right. Yeah, because 35%, uh, because, that's what I said. <laughs> but that's, well, yeah, because to be clear, like all of those homes' energy demand would be met, but all of the yes. other. So yeah, that's, exactly. about, that's about the same amount that residential energy dem- electricity demand exactly. is, yeah, which yeah. is good. That would be great. That is That, in my opinion, is one of the low-hanging fruit in terms of the transition to zero-carbon electricity because, well, you know, it's green energy, right? You're producing it from sunshine, and it's local. It doesn't have to go anywhere but your house. So it's well, especially because we could also put them on commercial buildings and apartment buildings. You could buildings. do that too, right? <laughs> yeah. But if we just did the residential ones, and especially if you pair it with a battery, even a small battery, yeah. one that you could use to to cut, to peak shave and to basically use the electricity you generate during the day to give yourself electricity at night. If you're just shifting it even by just a few hours, that combination, if that were ubiquitous, we would that would take us a long way to decarbonizing the grid. Plus, it takes a lot of stress off the grid because that sure. electricity is all used locally. And here's the other thing: currently, if you have solar panels. Without a battery, you send about 20 to 40% of the electricity that you generate to the grid. You're basically right. using the grid like a battery. But 
most of that goes to your neighbors. So it doesn't travel far. So it's still a pretty good deal. But if you had a mm-hmm. battery, it's even way better. It's much, much better. Because then you it, using it all in the location where it's being generated or most of it. And you know, you, there might be some seasonal shifting that you'd have to use the grid for. But here's the other thing. Most electricity is used for heating and cooling. Right, it's actually mostly in Connecticut. Most of my electricity is used for air conditioning, which is mm-hmm. over the summer. Yeah, which is when I produce most of my energy for my solar panels. So yeah. it matches up nicely. It that is, I think, the lowest hanging fruit of our low carbon energy production is residential solar with battery backup. And we that's where one place where we need yes subsidize the hell out of it. That should happen as fast as possible. And if that gets us even just 30% of our energy, then you get another 10, 20% from wind, you know, grid wind power. And then the rest is nuclear, hydrothermal, and geothermal, hydroelectric and geothermal. And that's one plausible path. And if we could get even more like some grid solar going or whatever, that's great too, or, but whatever. But that's a kind of, I think, what we're going to have to do. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's going to be the sh- the quickest, shortest path to get there. Yeah, and making use of available current technology. Yeah, that's all with and current the, technology. It's only going to get better. Right, improvements. It's right, only it doesn't going, even account yeah, for the But it is only going, going to get better. The solar and battery options are so steadily improving. It's only going to get better. You know, it's just silly that some people have decided to resist to resist that mm-hmm. really good option. You know, and and it's not. It's it's totally affordable because here's the thing: if you have money, you should just buy them outright. Your payback period is like eight to twelve years, depending on variables, you know, like where you live and et cetera. Yeah. But that's not bad: eight to twelve years, and then you get free electricity, you know. Um, but if you can't afford the upfront cost, you could do what I did, which is just contract. The only I had zero money upfront. The only thing, financial impact on me was that my electricity bills dropped by 20%. That was it. That was the only effect. Just here. What would you do if you were in my position? I'm super curious. I had somebody come out to look at my, because I live in a small lot house, right? So it's like skinny and tall. And because my roof has a roof deck on it, half of my roof is living space. The other yeah. half of mm-hmm. my roof is like industrial space where like my air conditioner is and stuff. And they looked and they looked at my AC bills and things like that. My house is very, very efficient. So my bills for, you know, I live alone. I pay about $250 every two months for my energy bills. Yeah, They're quite low. They basically said, it is not worth it for us to put solar panels on your roof. Mm-hmm. Oh. It's not worth it for them to do it, right? No, That's, for anybody to do it. Well, they were like, for you, it is not worth it. Like your return it would, on investment, your ROI pay. is not good enough. You need to wait until we have higher efficiency panels. Yeah, absolutely. Because they, okay. you know, if you wait a couple of years, they're going to be even better. They'll be cheaper. Yeah. They'll be more. They were efficient. basically like, you're going to pay for panels that will not offset your bills enough. Mm-hmm. Um, because the amount of space that we need to put in these panels, like they're not efficient enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, but I would get a second opinion because okay. I, yeah. uh, you know, it, it may, cause I don't know if they just don't think if they just think it's not really worth it for them, so they're saying mm-hmm. it's not worth it for you. But mm-hmm. especially if you can afford to buy them yourself, would, however much elect, you know electricity you make, even if it's only twenty percent of your bill, it's twenty percent of your right. It's still offsetting something. It's still offsetting so that's what something. I was curious about. Still, yeah, should still be the payback period is still the same. You know, mm-hmm. so I don't know. I don't know about that. And you, you get a lot of sunshine, right? So you're like, we you're, do get a lot of sunshine. You're all I'll sunshine you and air conditioning. So that's like a perfect scenario yeah, for solar panels. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I'd get a second opinion on yeah, that. Yeah, okay. Hmm. But yeah, but it, you know, like I generate 100% of my electricity on my roof and I live in Connecticut. Yeah. It's just all about... I have more generator. roof. I know. I have I a lot of roof, roof and I have yeah. no trees shading my roof. And the, and right. The, yeah, I do as well. Yeah. yeah. It was a no-brainer for me. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Evan, give us a quote. This week's quote was suggested by a listener, Andrew from Toronto. Thank you, Andrew. The shameful thing is not ignorance. On the contrary, that is the natural thing. The really shameful thing is not to want to know, to resist finding out when the occasion offers. It is never the ignorant who offers that resistance, but the one who thinks they know. That is the shameful thing, to think you know. He who thinks he knows something but is in fact ignorant of it, closes the door of his mind through which authentic truth could enter. 
And that is a quote from Jose Ortega y Gasset, who was a Spanish philosopher, born in 1883, died in 1955, uh, worked in the first half of the 20th century uh, as a philosopher. It's been char- He's been characterized as having a philosophy of life that can... Sp- that compromised a long hidden beginning in a pragmatist metaphysics inspired by William James. Yeah, some other uh, things here, proto existentialism, and some other things I don't know about in the world of philosophy, mm-hmm. realist historicism. But it uh, sounds like a very interesting person yeah. who, whom I've not been introduced to before this quote. So I appreciate that, Andrew. Thank you for introducing me. Um, to guess say. Yeah, I like the last line. He who thinks he knows something but is in fact ignorant of it closes the door of his mind through which authentic truth could enter. Yeah. It's a flowery Very way true. of saying, yeah, yeah, be humble. Mm-hmm. Don't prematurely think you know something. Yeah, good quote. Thanks, Evan. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, thank you all for joining me this week. All right. We have Thanks one more us. show before we go to Dallas. <laughs> oh, wait, I know. We I are know. Leaving. It's happening. Eclipse is coming. Eclipse is coming. I can't wait. All right, and until next week, this is your Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is produced by SGU Productions, dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible. 